Hi guys, Drew back at it again with Princess Craft RV and today we are in the beautiful Texas sun taking a look at the 17 FL by Bushwhacker. So starting right up front as always we're going to talk about the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, this unit is going to utilize a two inch ball so make sure you're outfitted with that and then we do have a kind of old-fashioned hand crank here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and raise that jack three inches above our ball. Uh, we're going to, of course, center ourselves underneath the coupler, then, of course, lowering that coupler on top of said ball. From there, we take our slide latch here, slide that completely forward, paying special attention that both teeth here on either side of that latch are fully engaged there in the frame and sitting flush. Uh, our recommendation is to then go through one step further and go ahead and pin that back, keep that from potentially rattling loose going down the road. Once you're connected there to your uh, ball and drop, you can feel free to go ahead and raise this jack all the way up into the stowed position. We're then going to take our tow chains, cross those underneath the coupler, and hook those onto the receiver of the vehicle. Very special to make sure that they are crossed underneath the, cup, uh, underneath the coupler and that you have enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that they may make contact with the pavement. We're then going to take our emergency breakaway cable. Now this is a very important safety feature. We wanna have this on a third or separate connection point on the receiver. This is gonna be your last line of defense or your last safety feature if these other tow components were to fail. As the two vehicles start to separate, this is going to act like a rip cord to the electric brake system. Riding right next to all that stuff is also going to be your seven way plug here. This is going to plug into the corresponding bumper receptacle on your vehicle, give you full function to your tow vehicle's braking system, charging system, as well as marker lights, uh, tail lights, things like that. So hopping right up here to your propane cylinder. Now this will be full for you at time of delivery. Uh, what, very easy to kind of remove that for maintenance and refilling. What you're gonna do is of course, make sure that your service valve is in the closed position. We're then going to disconnect our pigtail here. And as long as this uh, tension band is loosened, that tank will just go ahead and pull right out. Again, you can go ahead and get that filled at any service station or take advantage of an exchange program if you're inclined to do so. So since we are out here on the lot, we don't have a battery hooked up to the unit. We're using a good old fashioned jump box to give us uh, functions 12 volt appliances. Again, kind of imagine if you will that uh, when you take delivery of your unit, your battery will be in this location, somewhere close to that. Uh, and generally what we're gonna outfit these units with is going to be a flooded or lead acid battery. Uh, those do carry a small amount of maintenance. What that's going to entail for you is pulling those vent panels up on the top and at the very least inspecting that water level every 90 days, refilling with distilled water as necessary. As we transition here to the side of the camper, first up is going to be our freshwater connection. Uh, of course, this is how we're going to fill that onboard holding tank. Uh, this is what we're going to use in the capacity of boondocking off grid. Uh, before we get there, uh, hopefully we have some access to water. We're going to stick our drinking water hose uh, directly in there. We're going to fill up till we're satisfied. We cap off here. Now keep in mind that there is nothing to naturally pressurize this system. You do need to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures to make that water usable. Now, once you've done, uh, you're, you're done camping, you're returning the unit back to storage. If you haven't used all the water in the holding tank, we're gonna drain that water out uh, by this little valve here on the underside of the camper. With any valve, if you are against the flow, you're going to be uh, closed. And then with the flow, you will be open and we can see that water draining out from that location. Uh, next up is going to be our six gallon capacity water heater. Uh, this is a dual source water heater. So what that means for you is it will run on uh, 110 volt electricity. It will also run on propane with 12 volt direct spark ignition. So uh, six gallon capacity. Uh, manufacturer has some pretty specific recommendations on uh, safely maintaining this unit. Uh, that's going to include anytime the unit has, or anytime the unit is getting ready to go into storage for more than seven days, we're gonna not only make sure that we drain the whole uh, fresh water system, but we're also going to drain the water heater separate of that system. So uh, number one is going to be temperature. Make sure the unit is at a working temperature. It generally takes about eight hours for that to cool down. Uh, once you are uh, 
confident of that temperature, we're then, we then need to depressurize the water system overall. So uh, with no new water circulating or pressurizing the camper as a whole, we're going to um, go to any hot, the, fi the hot side of any fixture, uh, generally in a unit of this size, you're either limited to the kitchen or the bathroom sink. Uh, once you've done that, uh, once you found your preferred location, you're just going to open the hot side of that line. What you're going to see there is maybe a little bit of water, maybe a little bit of steam as that depressurized the holding tank of the water heater. You're then going to come right back outside. You're going to grab an inch and a sixteenth socket and extension. We're going to remove our drain plug here and we're going to allow the remaining six, five and a half gallons of water, six gallons of water to evacuate from this location. Uh, now, once you've done that, you're ready to go ahead and store the unit. Of course, we're going to kind of wrap up with low point drains and freshwater drains and things like that. After you've drained the unit completely, you're going to be ready for storage. Uh, when you're returning the unit or returning the, excuse me, when you're returning the unit back to service or taking it out of storage, we do need to prime or feed six gallons of water into the unit before we start heating it. So to do so, of course, you're going to uh, replace your cap if you haven't already. You may have to give that a few wraps with some Teflon or plumber's tape to make that water tight. But once you've done so, you're then going to repressurize the unit as a whole. What that means for you is if you're utilizing the potable water fill or the, excuse me, the potable water tank here, you're gonna flip on that 12 volt water pump to pressurize that system like we talked about. And then if you go ahead and are using the city water connection, it's as easy as turning the water on at the valve. So with again, the system pressurizing overall, you're again going to go to the hot side of that fixture. You're gonna turn that on. Now you're gonna see something slightly different this time. What you're going to see is definitely a lot more water, but also a lot of air as well. Uh, what it's doing is of course, it's displacing the, the air that has now filled the tank replacing it with water, that flow is gonna be very spitty, very interrupted, very airy. Uh, as this increases, uh, that water content increases in the tank, that flow is gonna normalize. You're, that is your indicator that you do have six gallons of water here in the unit, is that that flow normalizes. Once it has normalized, you can go ahead and choose your source and start heating that water. Now that we know how to properly maintain that water heater, uh, moving on here to our uh, solar plug here. Now this is essentially a plug and play direct connection to the battery. What this will allow you to do is go ahead and park your unit in the, in the shade, purchase a aftermarket uh, portable solar panel, make your easy plug and play connection here, take your panel out into the sun and take advantage of that solar power. Um, with all of those portable panels, your charge controller is gonna be built directly into the panel. Uh, that's going to be kind of the brains behind the operation in taking energy as necessary paying special attention not to overcharge those batteries. Uh, also, we have our 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. That's going to be our trailer connection there. That's going to be paired with a 25 foot, 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. So if we go ahead and look at this plug, we have two L-shaped or two slanted shapes and one L-shaped. And just like when you were a kid, if you match up the shapes, it's going to plug straight in. Once we've done so, it's a twist lock. So a eighth inch turn to the right that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down, lock it in further, keep that connection nice and secure. Now also included with your purchase, we're going to give you a small puck style 30 to 15 amp reducer. What that means for you is that's going to take this 30 amp wall connection, reduce that down to 15 amps so you can plug that into a household outlet, allow you to run some low draw appliances, maybe pre-cool the refrigerator, things like that. Now, if you want to uh, run higher draw appliances like the microwave, air conditioner, things like that, it's gonna be our recommendation that you do go ahead and upgrade that little puck style reducer to what we call a dog bone style reducer. It accomplishes the same thing. It is just separated by about 12 inches worth of cord and it really helps dissipate heat a whole lot better. Now, with any unit that I do deliver, or I do deliver, I do also recommend the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. Even with a smaller unit like we have today, there's still quite a bit going on throughout that unit electronically. It's the only thing that we can do to protect those sensitive electronics is using a inline surge protector. That's gonna protect you from substandard wiring, environmental surges, dirty power. All of those things are going to be prevented, uh, or I said, should say damage from those things would all be prevented 
by the use of a 30 amp surge protector. So if you have any questions on the products that we recommend or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to go ahead and educate you on what we recommend and how to use it. Now dropping down below here, we have our furnace exhaust. Uh, that's where we exhaust that uh, gas from the furnace. Now, uh, most importantly is the, that feature of it or that, that responsibility. So we want to allow that to exhaust. We're not going to restrict the flow or block that orifice from a safety standpoint. Also, one thing to keep in mind here in Central Texas, one thing that we have to contend with is flying insects and mud divers, quite a bit of them. So uh, this is uh, very susceptible to the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. It's going to be our goal to add some sort of screening material to go ahead and protect that appliance. Now that goes not only for the furnace here, but that's also going to go for the water heater and ultimately the refrigerator as well. Good time to talk about lug nut, torque, and tire pressure. These units are very spe uh, specific on their ratings for that. Uh, your tire pressure is going to be marked in the sidewall of the tire in that more uh, traditional location and also on the data tag up front here. So this particular unit is going to utilize a 50 PSI tire pressure. That should be the max rating that corresponds with on the tire as well. And now with any trailer tire, you do run those at the max tire pressure rating. That does give you the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Whether you are completely full or completely empty, that 50 PSI is going to be the magic number for you in terms of tire pressure. Now also lug nuts will be torqued down to 100 foot pounds here in the shop. That is the manufacturer's recommendation. Uh, they also recommend that you do go through a retorque procedure. So we can see this kind of outlined here um, on this sticker. And this particular manufacturer recommends that you check that torque and make sure it's maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque on the initial 50, 100, and 200 miles of initial travel. Now, anytime you remove that tire for service, whether you're getting a bearing pack, changing a flat, any of those things, make sure that you restart that retorque procedure over again. Moving on here, we have our city water connection. Uh, now, water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about that city water connection. Uh, generally, you'll find that these units are rated for a working water pressure in between 50 and 75 PSI. We're going to include a water pressure with your purchase. What that's going to do is regulate that water pressure well in within the specs of the manufacturer's recommendation. So uh, the one we include is going to be between 40 and 50 PSI that's going to get be, be more than sufficient for your needs. So when you're using that water pressure regulator or any water pressure regulator, it's important that we do hook that directly onto the water source or as close to the water source as we can. Once we've done so, we're going to hook our hose in line with that. Uh, of course, we do ultimately make our connection here at the trailer by rotating this trailer bound connection. Here we are uh, talking about the refrigerator here. Now, this is a slightly different unit that a lot of our customers are familiar with. Um, all your controls in terms of temperature and sources are going to be done right out here at on the, the rear of the unit. So if we go ahead and take a look at that, uh, you can go ahead and, and right off the bat, uh, make a visual representation of a line right down the center. Everything on the left side of that line is going to be utilized for propane gas. Everything on the right side is going to be electricity, whether that's going to be 12 volt electricity or 110 volt. So uh, starting with propane gas, if we want to go ahead and light this, we're going to go ahead and, and move this over to that high position. And we have a little visual window here so we can actually see when that lights. And what you would do is you're going to hold this down like you're lighting any pilot light. And you're going to uh, generally like I'll start out by holding this for 30 seconds before I even start igniting it. That's going to allow that, that gas to go ahead and flow through the lines. And then once I'm ready or satisfied, I go ahead and I try and while holding this down, I use my other hand and I spark this igniter as quickly as I can. Uh, and then I'll, I'll hold that down, use my other hand to open the window, see if I have a flame there. If I do, great. I hold it for like another few seconds to allow that thermal coupler time to heat up and then I'm good to go. Uh, if not, you'll again, hold this down for another 30 seconds and click that some more until you again see that flame. Uh, now, if we're running it on either 110 volt electricity or 12 volt electricity, this is going to be our temperature control. We will choose our source by flipping that toggle switch. And then we have one through seven here again on that temperature control. Uh, be, pay special attention to only use one energy source at a time. 
Um, not quite sure why, but the manufacturer thought it was important enough to put you, give you a little safety warning here, so we are just passing that along. Um, just about covers it there with the refrigerator. Do not forget, though, that, again, this is another intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects, so we are going to make sure that we screen these vents further to make sure that they're not getting in there and making that their new home. Uh, other than that, uh, if you're, you're, you're going to be back here far more often than that, but at the very least, make sure you're giving the components back here uh, overall inspection a couple times a year, um, making sure nothing's gotten in, everything still looks good. If everything looks good and it's still functioning properly, you're going to be good to go. Uh, to install or remove your vent cover here, very easy to do. We seat the slots up front, or up top I should say. We seat our locking mechanism or locking tabs here, and then we give those a quarter turn. That will go ahead and secure that. Always, always, always go back, give it a little tug, make sure it is in fact locked on. I'm sure there's been a million of these that have ended up on the side of a highway uh, because somebody just didn't give that a second check to make sure it was in fact locked on. Uh, moving on here, we have our outside shower. Of course, nothing too crazy or awesome. It's a, it's a shower head. It gives you access to hot and cold water. If you're rinsing your feet off after the beach or, or you know, rinsing some washing your pets, critters, whatever. Uh, you can do that from this location. This hose coils around the fixture there and everything is stowed in one location. So it's nice kind of a streamline. And then you do have a little holder here, which is cool as well. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of hold that out of the way while I talk about these low point drains and sewer outlet connections here on the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with these valves in the closed position, but we're gonna talk about the, the, the low point drains first. So. These are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. This is how we are going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. I've mentioned a couple times here throughout the presentation that anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, it is exceptionally important that we do drain all of the water from that freshwater system to keep everything nice and fresh and sanitary. So we're going to start with the freshwater holding tank up front. Uh, you only need to drain that if it's been in use. That's that first valve we've come to. We're then going to open up these valves. We have one for each side of the plumbing, one for the hot, one for the cold. We're gonna open those up. Once those have drained completely and the water heater has cooled down to a workable, te uh, workable temp, we're then going to drain the water heater outlining or using that procedure that we talked about previously here in this presentation. Now, once you've done all of that, the unit is gonna be ready for storage for an infinite amount of time. Everything will go ahead and stay nice and fresh. If you are doing a winterization or a full winterization process after that, you're then going to be replacing those lines or refilling those lines with an RV grade antifreeze and you will be using the onboard water pump to do that. We'll make sure we outline that when we get to the interior. Next up is going to be everybody's favorite thing to talk about and that is our dumping our wastewater and septic system. So. Uh, these handles are color coded in terms of functionality. So black for black water, black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. You're looking at toilet paper, solid body waste, all of that fun stuff. And gray water is going to be our sink water, shower water, the relatively cleaner of the two. Now it's very important that we do operate these properly. We wanna avoid any cross contamination or back feeding between the two systems. Uh, it's very important that we keep these in the closed position, these valves in the closed position. We're gonna use the onboard monitor panel and we are only going to dump as necessary. That becomes especially important when we talk about that black water tank because we need to keep that solid body waste and that toilet paper in as wet and flowing condition as we can. So with both valves in the closed position, we're going to remove our cap here and to go ahead and connect our sewage hose. And boy, did they really hammer that down tight. So with that out of the way, we can kind of see how this actually connects. You have two keyholes in this scenario. You have four keyholes, but your sewage hose may only have two keyholes. We're going to put those in the halfway position of those studs, and we're going to go ahead and rotate this until we are fully seated. Now with our, we're hooked up, we have our septic hose hooked up, we're ready to dump. A very popular option is if our tank is indicating full or we're planning on changing locations, is going to be dumping our black water valve first. That's very easy. We give that a six inch pull towards the rear of the camper. That's going to evacuate that, that tank completely, especially if we've kept that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Once we are fully, once we are confident that we have went ahead and 
fully evacuated that tank. We close that black water valve off. We go ahead and give that gray water a pull. That's gonna be a six inch pull towards you. That's gonna rinse any shared plumbing between the two as well as rinse your sewage hose out uh, on the way out. So here at the rear, we have our pass-through compartment. Uh, on each door, you are going to find a manual hold open, so no magnets or anything fancy here. You just have that kind of good old-fashioned spring-loaded clip. When you do go ahead and uh, release that, you have one latch and one keyed latch as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, making our way here to the rear of the unit, Nothing too crazy to talk about. Of course, you have your, your uh, marker lights, you have your tail lights, license plate bracket as well. You're also going to have stabilizer jacks on the rear corners as well. Uh, now keep in mind that these are for stabilization, they're not for leveling. You're going to use the included crank handle within the unit. You're going to insert that on the stud end here. Now once you've done so and pay special attention that you have already leveled the unit, then you're gonna go ahead and run these down. You're gonna make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to sure everything up. And that's all you're gonna to need to do. Same on the way up. You don't need to really hammer those down into position. Just keep in mind uh, that they're not gonna work themselves loose or anything like that. And then here on the rear in between those stabilizer jacks, this is the best place to get a picture of it. You have your spare tire mounted in between the frame rails. Now that is on a gravity feed system. To kind of see the business end of that, we're gonna come around here to this side. And you're going to have a three quarter inch drive nut here. Uh, follow the instructions here on the sticker to raise and lower that as needed. And again, it's just like a pickup truck. It is a gravity feed system. And just because we didn't see that on the, when we were talking about it previously, here's your stabilizer jack crank handle. That's gonna fit over that stud like so. So a cool thing that Braxton Creek is providing for us is going to be this auxiliary propane port. This is gonna utilize a quick connect fitting. So what that means for you is you can go ahead and tap into those propane lines and that will allow you to uh, you know, feed that gas to a auxiliary appliance. So whether that's going to be a propane grill, propane fire pit, for propane heater, any of those things, as long as it has that quick connect fitting, you can go ahead and plug it in here. Now, once you slide that collar back, you're gonna insert that male end fully. Once that snaps back, you're locked on. Then you do have a valve here that you need to open up for that gas to flow through that connection. When not in use, go ahead and take your dust guard here, make sure that's in place. That's gonna keep any road debris dust from depositing itself in the fitting. Uh, moving on here, we have a couple 15 amp outlets. So nothing too fancy, just a couple all weather outlets. If you're out here on the front porch, kind of uh, enjoying the space, you can go ahead and plug in the boom box or recharge your phone, whichever you need to do uh, with those onboard 15 amp outlets. Uh, further moving down here, we got a standard RV style step. What that means for you is, is if you kind of get in front of it, is it's going to uh, just be up and in. It's gonna lock in that in or stowed position to go ahead and pull it out. You do just go ahead and lift and pull straight towards you. And then we also have a door hold back. Uh, again, kind of the plastic variant of that. Uh, if we go ahead and open the entry door, we hook that on. So make sure that's seated there. And then we go ahead and take our screen door. We go ahead and disconnect that using this release tab here. Swing that into position. And now we can take advantage of that open air scenario. All right, guys, that just about covers it here on the exterior of the 17 FL. We're gonna hop on the inside and take a look at those appliances and accessories. Here we are on the interior. Uh, first up on the wall coming right in the unit is going to be your porch light. We saw that outside. Uh, it's just going to be a porch light up high here. And then if I kind of change positions here, uh, we have a very important piece of safety equipment. It's going to be our fire extinguisher. Now with all of our safety equipment, it's very important that we do go ahead and test that every single time we take the unit out. We're gonna do so in this scenario by pressing this green tab down 
If it springs back, that means you have life within the unit, you're good to go. If it were to stay depressed, it need, means you need to go ahead and replace the fire extinguisher. Uh, now kind of here into the living space, we have a recliner chair. There's no handle on this. It is just if you go ahead and press, put the pressure back, it's gonna go ahead and kick that legs portion out and recline. Here we have kind of like your dinette area or a single bench seat, and this would be your table. Um, it is just as easy as pulling that out. Now when we do go ahead and um, retract it or put it back in the spot, you do have a little spring-loaded uh, latch here that just needs to pull out and allow that to come down. And then uh, moving on here into the kitchen area of the unit we have first up is going to be our GFI receptacle. What that means for you is that all the receptacles within the unit are on the same circuit. If you go ahead and overload one, they kind of all follow suit, but this will be the reset point uh, for functionality. Next up, we have your convenience center or courtesy panel. It goes by a few different names in the business. This is gonna give you a real-time readout of where your tanks sit and level of full, as well as your battery. Uh, now, keep in mind that your battery will indicate full on here anytime you are plugged into shore power because that is being recharged uh, via the converter when plugged into shore power. So to get a true readout of where your battery sits in level of full, you need to unplug from shore power and then test from this location here. Uh, and then also we have our water heater sources as well. You have electric and then gas, or I believe it's electric and then gas. Uh, now you can run both sources at the same time. That's going to give you the highest recharge rate. Generally you're looking at about 17 gallons per hour. Next up in terms of efficiency is going to be standalone propane gas. Uh, that's going to give you about 14 gallons per hour. And lastly, electric is going to give you a recharge rate of 11 gallons per hour. We also have our water pump switch on there. And just a reminder that does pressurize that freshwater system that draws that water up from the tank to the fixtures to make it usable. And then next up you have your kitchen sink here. Of course, nothing too crazy. Access to hot and cold water, a small kind of hand washing, dishwashing sink uh, here. Also in the kitchen area, we have your cooktop. It's a two burner cooktop, uh, kind of comparable to a Coleman camping stove if you ever used one of those. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to take your uh, desired burner and turn that to the light. And then that gas flow is instantaneous and you start to hit that igniter here. Once you see that flame there, you can of course go ahead and adjust it in terms of intensity there. Um, very easy to use. Next up is going to be your standalone 110 volt uh, turntable style microwave. Uh, functions very much like any other microwave you've ever used. You have a couple presets up top, time and temperature down at the bottom, very easy to use. Uh, transitioning over here to your uh, air conditioner. Uh, this is of course a window AC. It's going to function very much as such. You have a couple different modes here. Uh, generally, you'll see a high and a low fan speed, and then also a high and a low air conditioner speed as well. You have a temperature control in here, kind of a thermostat setting within the setting. This does have a, a washable, reusable filter. Uh, slightly, if I'm being honest, kind of a pain in the butt to remove. You, you remove it here from this side. You very carefully finesse it around this corner, making sure you don't break it. Um, you know, no fault to Braxton Creek. It's just very hard to install a window AC, not in a window in a, 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 a unit of this size and have everything kind of function as the manufacturer design. So just, just a little workaround, uh, still very much usable. Uh, we then come down here and we have our uh, Jensen stereo unit here. This is gonna give us access to AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, um, HDMI inlets, as well as the USB inlet. You have a couple different zones in terms of speakers, things like that. But I find most of our customers are, uh, you know, very straightforward when it comes to using these. Uh, they have no problems. Uh, we talked about the controls of the refrigerator on the outside, just kind of opening up the door so you can take a look. Um, of course, you know, again, kind of like a small dorm style refrigerator. So not, not much, uh, nothing too crazy with that. One thing to mention is when you do have this loaded up, you do have a little locking tab there on the door to keep that uh, from coming open when you're going down the road. Also on that locking mechanism, uh, you do have kind of a storage option. So if we go ahead and, and you can see here on the clip, the, the, the groove closest to you is the lock mechanism. That's gonna keep that door from opening up. If we go to that second lock there and kind of finesse this into position, that's gonna keep that door cracked. 
Uh, why that becomes helpful for you is if you are storing the unit, you do want to keep that door open. That's going to help, uh, you know, keeping it from getting stinky in there with like mildew and things like that. So uh, when you're storing the unit, make sure you're cracking it. That's going to, again, keep, keep that scenario from taking place. And then if we kind of look here uh, to the uh, right side here, we have your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, that does have a test button that is also wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. Uh, it is very important, again, to test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. You'll do so by going ahead and pushing that test button. It's going to give you an audible sound. If it is sensing any of those gases, it will also give you an audible sound uh, and then uh, let you know which it's sensing by a series of light flashes. And then in between my legs here, we have your converter. If we look here on the right side, we have our 12 volt automotive blade style fuses, the blade style fuses. Those are replaceable, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack at the auto parts store, keep them with the unit. And then there on the left side, we have our 110 volt appliances. Uh, those are going to utilize a resettable light switch style breaker, the same variant that you will find and at your in your fuse panel box at home. One thing to mention here about this unit is it this is, is not only kind of your power distribution center, but it is also your converter as well. It does have like a built-in cooling fan and times where that, that, that uh, switch over from 110 volt to 12 volt is taking place. Like if you have a lot of lights on, things like that, you may hear that fan kick on because it's over producing heat. That's totally fine. We just like to give you a heads up that you may hear that fan running uh, in the background of this appliance. And that is solely due to kind of a higher power consumption than what would necessarily be considered normal operation of the converter. As we make our way here to the restroom, a couple things to speak of on the way. Uh, all the overhead lights that you see are uh, controlled by a, a, their own independent switch. And it is just kind of a push style button in the center of each lens. We're then going to make our way here to the uh, overhead fan. If we go ahead and, and crank that open, we then have a speed control here. So low, medium and high. And that is an exhaust only fan. The idea being is that you can go ahead and open up the door, open up the windows, uh, run that in reverse. And what that will allow you to do is kind of create a cross breeze throughout the unit. Uh, one very important thing to mention is that this does need to be closed when going down the road. So it seems like something that is often forgotten about. Make sure we are closing this completely before going down the road because it may not be there when you get to where you're going, if not. Making our way here into the restroom, first thing you're going to notice is the shower door. This is kind of a cool setup. They utilize this uh, flexible plastic here and it does kind of lock in that closed position. And if we push in slightly, this is self-retracting. It's not like crazy spring-loaded that it's gonna take off on you or anything, but it will um, kind of self-retract. And then as we're looking here into the restroom, first thing up is going to be your shower head. Uh, now what you're going to do is of course have access to hot and cold water. And, and um, to conserve that water consumption, uh, you will find an on off here on the head. What that allows you to do is go ahead and set your mixture at the fixture to what temperature you're comfortable with. And then you can go ahead and turn it off here at the head uh, because generally six gallons doesn't translate to an exceptionally long shower. What we find most of our customers have to contend with is doing like a military Navy style shower where they're turning this water on and off throughout their shower to again, make, it, make their hot water last. So uh, next up is going to be the toilet. This is gonna utilize a pedal style flush toilet, very easy to talk about and use. It will be a light press to uh, fill the bowl with water. Now, uh, just a, a kind of tip here is you're going to wanna keep water in the bowl uh, during use. It's gonna keep, help keep the bad smells down in the tank when you go to go ahead and flush it. Uh, when you do go to flush it, you're just gonna push that down to the floor. Now, when we talk about any chemical treatments, whether that's going to be, uh, you know, uh, deodorizing products, tissue dissolvers, sensor cleaners, any of that stuff is going to be introduced right here at the toilet. And it is also very important that you uh, use a single ply RV grade toilet paper. Uh, that may go without saying. And if you're not doing any boondocking and you, you do have essentially the, the sources to do so, make sure you're going ahead and utilizing as long of a flush as you can. I know it sounds silly, but we do, again, I can't stress enough how important it is to keep that black water tank in as wet or flowing condition as you can. Uh, other than that, here in the restroom, I think that just about covers it. You do have, a, again, a light overhead light 
that is gonna utilize that same on off switch that we've seen throughout the camper. All right, so starting above my head here, a, a very important piece of safety equipment. It's going to be our nine volt smoke alarm. Uh, as you can see, uh, it utilizes a nine volt battery. It's gonna be my recommendation to go ahead and keep a spare nine volt battery with the unit. Uh, nothing worse than having that battery go low in the middle of the night and you have to contend with that uh, constant reminder throughout the night. So keep in mind, uh, that we are going to test this every single time we take the unit out. We're gonna do so by pushing the test button here. We're going to uh, let it audibly tell us that it's okay, and we're gonna be good to go for our camping trip. Uh, also here on the cabinet side of the wall, a couple things you see is your resettable plug there for the air conditioner. It has its own kind of GFI protected plug. You may find yourself having to test or reset that. And then to the right of that, we have your thermostat for your furnace. Uh, now this has a couple ways to turn it on. You have an on off switch here at the top. Uh, these switches here are kind of famous for being stiff. So I've never seen one get broken. So to the left is going to be on. Feel free to go ahead and muscle that into position. And then we're going to choose our comfort level here at the bottom. Now, once we've done so, that blower motor kicks on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. And in a camper of this size, I would not be completely surprised if it set off that smoke alarm. Uh, that's A-OK -okay as far as the manufacturer's recommendations go. Uh, generally what's happened is it, as it starts to run, that efficiency rating goes way up. You're also contending with burning off any kind of dust or road debris that is deposited on the unit while travel. So if it sets off your smoke alarm, uh, don't worry about it. You just have to deal with it for, again, about the first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, now coming here, we have our emergency exit window. You can see that it is going to utilize the tension pull down shades. Uh, you find those throughout the camper. Uh, when I say it's our emergency exit window, that doesn't mean that it doesn't function as a normal window. We can see if we went ahead and opened that up, that it would allow airflow throughout the unit. If we were inclined to do so, we could go ahead and pull this screen out of the way and also exit from this. It is going to come full out like a doggy door. When we go ahead and return that window or close that window, we just lift that up, making sure we are uh, stowing that back in its original position. And then here along the bottom here of the cabinetry, we have a couple 15 amp outlets. This is designed by the manufacturer to kind of be the designated TV area of the camper. You can of course power that television with those 110 volt outlets. And then what we have here is going to be your antenna booster. Now this corresponds with an omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna on the roof of the unit. Uh, what that allows you to do is go ahead and turn this on. If you do a channel search on your television, what it's going to do is automatically switch out the best signal or search out the best signal for you. And then bring in again that over the air programming dependent on that, that signal. So it's a really cool feature. It's going to allow you to have some sort of entertainment uh, while you are you know, kind of off the beaten path. And then we do have a couple USB chargers as well that's gonna allow you to maintain any of your devices while you are here in the bed area of the camper. All right, guys, we hope you enjoyed the walkthrough here on the Bushwhacker 17FL by Braxton Creek. If you have any questions or concerns, maybe something we missed, maybe something more you'd like to see or have us go further in explanation, uh, feel free to comment below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We really appreciate you watch, watching our videos. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We hope you have an excellent day. I'm a mechanic. There's dirt everywhere.